Hello and welcome to the global launch of the Network Readiness Index 2021. My name is Mariam Chadanelli and I'm the NRI project manager at Port Children's Institute. For those less familiar with our work, the Network Readiness Index is a global report that was founded in 2002. And over the past two decades, the NRI has established itself as one of the most comprehensive assessments of digital readiness. The NRI captures how effective policy and governance can support the harmonious integration of people and technology, and how this process itself can have a positive impact on the economy and society in general. This year's report ranks 130 economies across 60 different indicators and measures their performance in four key pillars, technology, people, governance, and impact. In light of increased reliance on technology and the accelerated pace of digital transformation, tracking network readiness is more important now than ever. Today's online event, which will last about 90 minutes, will begin with a presentation of key findings from the 2021 report, led by Professor Sumitra Dutta, co-founder and co-editor of the index. We will then move on to a high level panel, panel discussion around the theme of shaping a more digitally inclusive pandemic recovery. The discussion will be moderated by Dr. Bruno Lambon, co founder and co editor of the NRI, and will involve distinguished speakers from international organizations, the private sector, and government. Right after the discussion, we will hear concluding remarks from the CEO of Portugal's Institute, Rafael Escalona Reynoso. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the NRI Knowledge Partner, STL, for a very successful partnership for the second year in a row. I would also like to express my gratitude towards our panelists, as well as our advisory board members and technical advisors who ensure high quality and technical accuracy of the NRI year after year. Without further ado, I'd like to now give the floor to Professor Sumitra Dutta, who will make a presentation. Well, thank you, Mariam, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone from different time zones. Thank you so much for joining us for this 2021 launch of the NR NRI report. As Mariam said, uh, this NRI report is something that Bruno and I helped co-create in 2002 at the World Economic Forum. And over the last two decades, it has really evolved into an important benchmark and important evaluation guiding the development of technology and the deployment for competitiveness and uh, development of different nations. Now, this year's report, of course, is the result of a collaboration with a number of individuals, number of organizations. I'd like to echo my thanks also to STL for the sponsorship of the work for the second year. And of course, express my thanks to the team that led to the creation of the, G of the NRI this year. Uh, besides Bruno and myself, there's Rafael, Mariam, Sylvie, and Abdella, very, very strong members of the team that have helped to create this wonderful product. And the NRI also benefits from a technical advisory board. The names out here on the slide, Michaela, Andrew, Irene, Elena, John, and Chris. And they provide us a very valuable feedback and we have a small distinguished advisory board too, with Osman, Diego, uh, Taufik, and Dr. Hessa. And today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Taufik and Dr. Hessa here with us in the panel. So let me sort of give you a broad structure of how this very brief presentation is structured. I encourage you to go to the website of networkreadinessindex.org or porcelansinstitute.org and download the report and see all the details because the report has a lot of data, a lot of very useful messages and details. And I obviously, for the sake of brevity, will focus on just a few high level messages today. So I will begin my presentation by talking about what is the NRI? So what is the basic philosophy of the NRI? I'll talk briefly about some of the rankings and the key findings, and then end with some key messages and takeaways of the report from this year. So what is the NRI? 
the NRI is something that, as I mentioned earlier, we helped create in 2002. And really, if you think back to decades ago, the vision of how technology was going to be used was actually quite limited to a set of factors that today has evolved and become much more broader and much more holistic societies as far as society is concerned. And as a result of this uh, broader influence of technology in our daily lives, uh, we have also evolved the NRI sort of model over the last few years. And today the NRI model we believe is probably capturing the heart of the thesis behind technology in society today, which is that our collective future, our collective inclusive sustainable future will require a harmonious integration of people and technology. Uh, people and technology form the two key assets that we have deployed. Uh, proper governance is very important to bring these two assets together. And we have to look at the impact along multiple dimensions, not just economic impact, but also more generally, if you look at, for example, the sustainable development goals, the quality of life and so on. Now, one model which has, a uh, one aspect of the model which has got emphasized even more, I think in the recent years, is this whole governance pillar. Because these elements of trust, regulation, inclusion have become very, very high on the agenda. I think today, if you're talking about looking at how technology can deploy it effectively in society in different nations. So that's the structure and the thesis of the model. And of course, we try and collect indicators from around the world uh, that is available for a large number of countries. As Mariam said, we try and cover 130 countries. So it's a very large number of countries. And we are of course limited by the kind of indicators available for a large number of countries around the world. So we have to make some trade off the choice of indicators, but we cons consistently try to look for new indicators and better indicators. And we work with partners to help create better indicators as we go along the journey. Now, each year we also do the theme for the NRI. And it's not surprising that the theme this year is linked to this recovery in the post pandemic world. I hesitate to use the post post pandemic because in many ways, you know, with the new variant, the pandemic still seems to be alive and well. But having said this, I think we have made some definite progress with the vaccines and the large scale deployment of many new, let's say, uh, ways of treating the pandemic and the virus. But one issue which has come to the forefront really is that how is inequality getting affected in this sort of post pandemic world? or at least in the post pandemic world that we're evolving towards. Because uh, in many ways, the pandemic has highlighted some of the strengths that we have and also the weaknesses that we have. I think on the strength side, there has been tremendous, tremendous progress and amazing progress in how the vaccine was created with global collaboration. On the weakness side, some of the digital discrepancies have become even more apparent. Uh, even in, for example, in a rich city like Manhattan, uh, where I spend a lot of my own time professionally, uh, during the pandemic, uh, about 22% of the households in Manhattan did not really have access to workable broadband internet. And as a result, what happened was students, for example, could not in fact do their work at home. They had to go and you know, access internet in other public locations for their work study or do it on the mobile phone. And so this is something which is really suboptimal. And what we see is that these kinds of challenges that even the rich nations face are actually even more acute in some of the poorer nations. So the whole idea in terms of how will the world look like going forward is an important one that we all have to focus on, especially given what has happened. Now, we all are aware that uh, a number of countries have launched a variety of uh, recovery packages. And these recovery packages uh, uh, have, for example, uh, certainly you know, provided a boost, helped different uh, nations actually revive the economies. And one of the big question marks that we have is uh, what kind of a recovery are we going to actually see in the future? Is it going to be a K-shaped recovery that is on the left-hand side? where essentially you have some segment of the population, some segment of the world, some countries you know, moving fast and in fact moving even faster with the help of technology and some others being left behind. 
or will we in fact be able to create a more sustainable and more equal world by shifting the lower end of the cape upwards and getting everyone up on the technology curve, getting everyone up on the sustainability and on the inclusive future curve. So we clearly see that technology will have to be an enabler in this sort of, if you want a V-shaped recovery, because we know that uh, today, if you look at health, we look at education, look at many other aspects of uh, society, uh, we do not have enough doctors and nurses, we do not have enough teachers. So we cannot expect that we can provide the same level of care to everyone or similar education to everyone without deploying technology. Technology becomes a necessary part of providing access to key resources for everyone around the world, especially if you want to be able to have a more equal and a more V-shaped recovery. Now, let me move on to the rankings part of the report. Every year we rank about 130 nations and this year also we have provided the ranking. And the rankings of course are interesting because they provide some relative assessment of how nations compare and how different nations have progressed and how the situation is evolving globally. And at the same time, the rankings, of course, only present part of the picture. There's a lot more detail out here in terms of the progress of every nation. And we encourage you to look at the detailed report to be able to understand what are the strengths and weaknesses of different countries and try to actually evaluate you know, which are doing better and which are the ones where we can actually see significant improvements. Now, if you look at the top 10 economies out here, you see, I think, one fact, which is that all these countries are high income group economies. In fact, in the top 25, they're all high income group economies, the top 25. So what this means really is that uh, there is an interesting question, and this is the question of correlation or causation in terms of how much is digital intensity of the economy linked to the economic level of development of the country. And does, in fact, more digitalization economy lead to further development and further wealth creation? Or, in fact, having more wealth creation allows you to invest more in digital technology. So there is an interesting relationship out there. But having said this, we do see some countries like China and Malaysia, which are moving up. These are two upper middle income economies ranked right now at 629 to 38th ranks. And also we see some countries like India having made a big jump in the rankings this year. So we see progress out here, but clearly there is a concentration of a few rich economies at the very top that remains relatively stable over the years. Now, if you look at the rankings along different dimensions and the different ways to slice and dice the data because a lot of data out here, uh, one high level assessment can be who are the leaders in the different pillars. You see that on the technology pillar, the USA is the leader. And this is not surprising because the USA still happens to be the cradle of a lot of research, innovation and technology and a lot of the new technology ideas are actually generated from there. And at the same time, you see some other nations, in fact, taking the lead in some of the other dimensions of other pillars. So in the people dimension, we see Korea and Denmark and Finland at the top three. On the impact dimension, we see Singapore, Sweden, Netherlands in the top three. And of course, this gives some kind of a at least a assessment of how the progress is actually distributed. So what we see is that not every country excels equally in all four dimensions and technology alone is not enough to in fact ensure that the technology values derived by society as a whole. Now we can look at different segments of the world's sort of population, the world's collection of nations. And if you look at the category of nations by income level, you see that uh, by different income level groups, you have these leaders in their respective groups. Uh, in the high income group, you see countries in the top 10, very ranked very highly. In the upper middle income group, I mentioned China and Malaysia coming up closer and moving up faster. And in the lower middle income group, I mentioned that India actually has moved very highly this year to 67th position from last year in the low 80s. So it's actually very good progress by India. And India certainly is making very good progress in multiple dimensions on the technology front. And we see a number of other interesting elements that I think are of note. Now, if you look at a regional basis, these are the regional leaders. 
And here, if you look at, for example, Africa, South Africa, Mauritius, and Kenya are the leaders in Africa. And it's interesting to see in Africa, the level of progress in some nations actually is again quite remarkable. And again, gives us hope that many low income economies are today deploying technology and being able to make significant progress along multiple dimensions of the economy. Along the Arab states, we have the UAE at the top, Saudi Arabia at number two and Qatar at number three. And today, in fact, we'll have the honor of having some views from some Qatari leaders in the, in the technology area. And again, you can look at other leaders in other countries, and I encourage you to once again look at the details in the report in more depth. Now, if you look at different analysis, and I just present you only one analysis, and this is on the vertical axis, the NRI score, on the horizontal axis, the GDP per capita and PPP terms, what you see is that there is a rough, let's say, correlation between NRI scores and the GDP per capita, the wealth level of the countries. And this is what I mentioned earlier. So we do see this correlation causation element fitting in between income levels and, te and technology NRI scores. And I think it's a challenge for countries to be able to increase the technology investments and move up at the same time, hopefully invest and create greater wealth in the economies. So let me sort of just move on to the next part and the final part of the presentation which is really focused on the key messages and the takeaways. There are seven key messages and I will keep them at a high level. There's a lot of data behind this analysis and the messages and I encourage you to look at the report for the data behind these reports. But at a high level, the first message from this year's NRI is that we always, we always looked at digital transformation as a priority. So if you look at the last 10 years, especially, everyone said digital transformation is a priority. But what the pandemic has really done is that it has transformed digital transformation from a priority into a global imperative. And we emphasize the word imperative because of the fact that if the future has to be a V-shaped recovery, not a K-shaped recovery, if we want more and more of the world's population benefit from inclusive sustainable future, technology has to be deployed effectively to generate that kind of V-shaped uh, recovery. Otherwise, there's no way we'll be able to achieve all the SDG goals. We'll be able to create some kind of an equal future for people. What we've also seen from the COVID, uh, let's say phenomenon, the pandemic over the last year, is that there are all kinds of divides being created and some older ones being highlighted. I had mentioned the divide of access to the internet for education in rich nations like and rich cities like Manhattan. But a similar story is playing out across other kinds of divides. Uh, look at the divide across gender. So we have data and a report that actually shows that uh, this divide across gender has got accentuated during the pandemic because many women have had to give up the jobs or have had to focus more in terms of looking after the family. Uh, often also in situations where women have lower access to the internet uh, even before the pandemic, and that has got accentuated during the pandemic. And what is interesting is some of this divide, the gender divide, is not limited to the lower income economies alone. It is actually quite uniform across all income levels. And this is an interesting question that we have to actually question and ask, is that are these divides sustainable? Do these divides help us to create a better world? And let's actually be more aware about the kind of divides that we are creating society around us. Technology can help equalize the global recovery. I had mentioned this point earlier. And I think what we are finding is that as the governments around the world adopt stimuluses of various kinds of fiscal packages, certainly it helps the recovery. But if we really want to create an equal, inclusive sort of world in the future, technology will have to be deployed effectively. And this is along the multiple dimensions, but certainly along the four mentioned out here, the health, the greening of the economy, infrastructure, digital transformation, education. I think all these elements will require a strong investment from the private sector, the public sector in digital technologies. The message number four is about what really captures excellence in network readiness. And all of our data shows us that uh, the countries that do well on the network readiness do it because of a holistic approach. 
is not because they're only good at one approach, unless a technology or something else, but you need to have this holistic approach to be able to excel in multiple dimensions. If you do not have a good regulatory and business friendly environment in the country, entrepreneurs will not be able to use technology to create new businesses. Small and medium sized businesses will not be able to use technology to address global markets. So you have a number of issues out here in terms of which you have to bring excellence in multiple dimensions to be able to create that kind of excellence and network readiness in a certain nation. Message number five is about who is in fact, uh, you know, capable of aspiring towards high levels of technology excellence. And what we are finding is that despite the concentration of the rich economies at the top of the ladder, top of the rankings, we do find significant progress being made in the lower income economies. And so we do remain optimistic that technology readiness, network readiness remains an achievable goal for all economies. And as they invest more and more in technology over time, they can in fact increase uh, various aspects of the national performance competitiveness over time. And again, as I said, countries like India are making excellent progress in this area where a number of initiatives in the country in the last, let's say decade or so, have really pushed forward a number of important dimensions like online payments. You know, India is extremely successful in online payments thanks to his whole India stack and UPI kind of interface provided in the country. But I think even every economy, the leadership should have the ambition to be able to push forward. And it's not something that should be only limited to the rich countries. Message number six is that uh, digital technology champions are emerging in different parts of the economic spectrum. And they are certainly helping bridge some of the income group gaps. I mentioned India and China briefly earlier, but we also have examples of Rwanda, Vietnam, Ukraine that are continuing to show progress and they're closing the performance gap across income groups. So I hope I remain optimistic that uh, as we look forward in the years, as the importance of digital technologies has become more and more clear for nations, we will see increased investments and increased efforts in trying to deploy technology effectively to bridge some other income group gaps and increase development levels in the economy. The final message really is about uh, what the ultimate goal is, you know, why technology is important for our country. And really what we are finding out here in the NRI is that technology by itself is not an end. It really is a means to create value society and value in terms of both uh, economic value and also social value. It's a, it's a means to help achieve a better and more inclusive sustainable society by helping achieve more sustainable development goals. And I think fundamentally what we have to understand is that technology is an important enabler, but it has to essentially be designed so that it creates value society as a whole. So let me conclude out here and thank you for your attention. As I said, there's a lot of data that is available in the NRI report. I encourage you to look at the day report, read it of interest as it suits your attention, uh, as it suits your interest. And then also look at the data we have made available on the website. Plenty of data is there, you can analyze it. And the website links are listed out here on the slide. Thank you so much. And I hand the floor back now to my colleague, Dr. Prun Landberg. Thank you. Thank you, Sumitra. Uh, and I hope uh, indeed that this presentation will encourage everybody to go to the report and the data, uh, which is uh, behind the analysis and messages uh, that were just presented. Uh, we now have a very high level uh, panel to discuss the theme of the report and uh, help us go a bit further into uh, identifying the key issues raised by NRI 2021. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, however, I would like to um, uh, give the, the floor through a video message, pre recorded video message to His Excellency uh, Mohammed bin Ali Al Manna and Mr. Minister of Information and, Economy and Communication in uh, the state of Qatar. Uh, we are very privileged that the minister has accepted to send this message. So let's listen to it. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be part of this global launch of Network Readiness Index 2021. Also, I would like to thank the team for the continuous and dedicated efforts over the years for publishing the report. 
the NRI framework and reports have been providing essential guidelines for government on the key factors and trends that enable ICT developments and make national economies benefit from them. I can confirm that NRI has been reliable and comprehensive benchmark that Qatar is looking at while setting high level policies and developing strategies in all priority areas for our ambitious national agenda. We are looking forward to the new NRI report as the importance and need of tracking the status of the network readiness has increased, especially when considering the impact of COVID-19 around the world, where the pandemic proved how technology can be extremely powerful and helpful. Also, it created motivation to keep developing the ICT sector and accelerating pace of digital transformation. In the past decade, the government of Qatar has taken a major step to equip ICT sector with key policies, strategies, and regulatory instruments to empower growth and innovation. We believe that the power of ICTs can be enabled through targeted governance on a comprehensive view on the impact for the national and the global economy, society, and the environment. So far, Qatar has established a strong telecom infrastructure with top performance by global standards that helped delivering universal high-speed fiber and mobile broadband access to the entire population and local businesses. While the government has achieved the current level of infrastructure readiness, we keep on building our strategies for the future to continue the pace through emerging technology adaptation. We are fast progressing on establishing a comprehensive national roadmap for AI, IoT, machine to machine, and blockchain adaptation. We are developing related regulatory instruments to create a strong foundation for an innovative and growing IT sector and digital economy. We look forward to the new year with all the new challenges, opportunities to develop and grow horizontally, keeping in our mind a key objective, enabling the availability of the required tools to empower the local and international community for the good of humanity. Finally, I would like to say that it has been a pleasure being with all of you and wish you a successful launch event for this year and the coming years. So, uh, uh, again, uh, renewing thanks to, to the minister, for, uh, Minister Al Manal, for sending this message. Uh, we already heard from him uh, key words that resonate very much with the report uh, that has been presented by Sumitra. And namely, it's not enough to invest in infrastructure. One needs also to uh, set up proper regulation to set up proper governance. So uh, again, we, uh, we have some very important keywords already thrown to us by uh, Mr. Almanal. Let me now uh, introduce the, uh, the panel and I will do that in uh, alphabetical uh, order. Um, we have first uh, Ankit uh, Agarwal, uh, who is the uh, Managing Director of STL, Starlight Technologies uh, Limited. Uh, Dr. Hessa Al-Jaber, who is currently a uh, UNITU Broadband Commissioner and also Commissioner of the WHO ITU Commission on Information and Accountability for Women and Children's Health. And if I may say so, uh, the former uh, Minister of ICT in, in Qatar. Uh, then we have His, Excellent, um, His Excellency Tofik Jelassi, Assistant Director General for Communication and Information in UNESCO. And finally, uh, Mr. Javier Lopez Casarin, uh, Federal Congressman, Chairman of the Committee on Science, Technology and Innovation of the House of Representatives of Mexico and member of Mexican Green Party. So welcome to you all. Um, the theme of the, uh, this panel 
is uh, shaping global recovery. You have uh, noticed that in spite of the fact that all of us here today, uh, not just on the panel, but also in the audience, um, are technology enthusiasts. Uh, the, one of the reasons why we participate in this event is that we've seen on the ground what technology could do to better uh, this world. And you may have noticed that in this report, we also um, underline the fact that, you know, although uh, COVID has helped more people, more organizations to become aware of the possibilities and opportunities linked to technology and technological innovation, we are not sure yet of which way the recovery will go. And clearly inequalities are one of the elements that could hamper that recovery. Hence our uh, tendency without being alarmist to want this report to draw the attention on what could go wrong. So let me uh, just start with a very generic question and we'll ask all of our um, panelists to uh, answer it very briefly, typically in one minute, so everybody can hear the sound of your voice before we get into uh, what should look like a discussion. And this first generic question is, we've all seen how fast uh, something as traumatic as COVID could change our daily lives. What has been in your respective daily lives, in your functions, in your family, in uh, your neighborhood, uh, one element you would say that you consider as very symptomatic of how inequalities could be increased before we actually start discussing on how we want to, to mitigate that. So that's a very generic uh, and vague question at this stage. Uh, let me um, uh, first um, uh, turn uh, again, respecting uh, the alphabetical order to uh, Ankit Agawal. Uh, my apologies, Bruno, if you could repeat the last part of your question. Yeah, we, we've all seen during the, uh, the pandemic how uh, the uh, rapid changes could create more inequalities among us. It, it, mm -hmm. You have one example uh, that you would like us to hear. Absolutely. Um, I think this is uh, extremely relevant. Uh, firstly, thank you uh, for having uh, STL as part of this. Uh, we're very proud to partner um, and be part of the NRI uh, index. What I clearly see out here in India is that uh, there was huge uh, you know, disparities uh, that we could see in terms of the impact of COVID. Uh, there was a much larger impact in rural parts of India than there was in tier one cities. And clearly uh, one of the biggest factors of that was in terms of hospitals and medical availability. But I also think, uh, uh, indirectly, there was uh, also a larger impact because of lack of broadband connectivity, uh, particularly in rural India, uh, which uh, if it was there of high quality, could have been utilized for doing services like telemedicine or basic consultation, uh, by which the impact could have been uh, lower. So I think this is one of the largest uh, uh, disparities I was able to observe. And we really hope that as our networks develop, uh, we are able to improve that. Very good. So thank you, Ankit. So the, the rural urban divide uh, may have been indeed enhanced by, by COVID. Uh, Dr. Hessa, what is your view on it? Yeah, I think yeah, I come from the Middle East. If you, if you will go see in the Middle East, we're having different 100% economy. We're having the very rich country. We're having developing uh, economies and we're having very fragile and conflict uh, affected countries like uh, uh, in Syria or Iraq. Definitely when it comes to uh, connectivity, connectivity, it's not there uh, everywhere. And, uh, and, if I, and if I recall, uh, UNESCO had uh, in, in one of their, no, uh, yeah, UNICEF in one of their reports they uh, indicated that out of the seven uh, Middle Eastern country that they did a survey with them, 55% of the students have limited access to uh, online uh, uh, schooling. So that, yeah, and that's mean 45% uh, don't, don't have. And if you look to our uh, population, we are young population, 60% 
of uh, of MENA region is less than 25 percent. I mean, 25 years. So that means definitely this impact the education, impact the providing of health. And my concern is uh, is education because according also to UNICEF, more than 110 million uh, kids in, 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 in MENA school, they, they will really impacted badly by uh, COVID. And the lack of connectivity definitely will not give them access to, um, to uh, education. Thank you. So uh, thank you for reminding us uh, also of the Middle East as being one of the regions where inequalities are high in terms of income per capita. And the uh, examples you, uh, you were giving, Dr. Hessa, uh, echo the ones given by Sumitra in his presentation about uh, increased inequalities in terms of access to education when it goes online. Um, the, uh, let me uh, uh, turn uh, now to, uh, to Tofik, uh, since uh, you mentioned UNESCO, that gives me a segue to, to ask you, Tofik, what are the major inequalities that you've seen growing from your point of view? Just to build on what Dr. Hassa said, uh, I think this uh, digital divide is not only digital, it's of course financial divide, it is also information divide, it's also knowledge divide. Uh, the frustration of millions of pupils who cannot continue schooling because they don't have access to the internet. I mean, I think more than ever, we saw this two-class society, if not a multi-class society. I mean, think of the parents, what a frustration that their kid wants to learn, but they cannot provide him or her with the means to continue learning. Based on our data, 1.6 billion learners couldn't continue their education. Even today, we see uh, million, hundreds of millions uh, of pupils who cannot go to schools because schools are still closed in their countries. And based on our study, over 100 million children are falling below the minimum proficiency level in reading as a result of the pandemic and as the result of the digital divide. So I think this is uh, more than a cry for uh, government officials, public sector and beyond to say, what can we do? What have we learned from this pandemic? Because clearly, there, I, I'm afraid there'll be other crises maybe uh, under virus, uh, other viruses or whatever uh, pandemics uh, ahead of us. What, what can we learn and how can we prepare our society to be resilient in the face of uh, future crises? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tofik, for broadening also our scope of this discussion beyond just technology and even beyond education. Uh, indeed, we have to look at possible divides all together, and the, uh, you already gave us uh, a fertile avenue for further discussion in this uh, in this panel. Uh, turning now to, to Javier Lopez Casarín with the same same question about growing divides. Good morning, Bruno. Good morning to my fellow panelists, Sumitra. It's nice seeing you, Rafael, and everyone. Um, well, uh, as, as you may figure out, in Mexico, as in Latin America and the Caribbean, perhaps education is the example that will. Show, show one of the most negative COVID-19 impacts. In, in fact, there are many more, but I would like to focus it uh, just in education for the huge impact that it, that it will have on future generations. In terms of access to technology and digital tools, millions of students were unable to continue their studies in virtual mode. That relies not only on connectivity, but also on the preparation of content and the preparation of, of teachers and the way to adapt in a fast way uh, to continue um, on, 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 on school, uh, school matters. So um, this is not well, however, this is not a, a matter of access to technology and digital tools per se. It is true that economic inequality, inequality also um, really reflected the, 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 or widened the social gaps uh, under the pandemic. We have a, a wide gap that we need to put attention. And I think that's one of the most uh, palpable things that, that, that came out. Over 650,000 junior school uh, students did not re-enroll. That means a lot of students lost over a year of preparation. Uh, and that's only in between 2020 and 2021. Perhaps due to 90% of the Mexican households 
so their incomes reduced. That's 90% of, uh, of the homes. For this and other crisis, uh, I, I think the world faces, um, and I'm quite, quite motivated by, by the work by, by the Portugal Institute, which will give us a compass, try to understand as many things that we can to address them in a proper, in a proper way. And I'm quite convinced that as, as Sumitra said, it has to be from a holistic vision. It has to be by that. That's a point that technology and innovation are very powerful tools uh, to, to build on bridges uh, that, uh, over the digital um, gap, uh, which we divide uh, the, the social scale. So I think that's, that's the way that we should, that we should um, address. Hence, there is the importance of the index that we present today, as it certainly will offer uh, the windows of opportunity in which Mexico must work to improve welfare on the societies, seeking always for uh, equality and inclusiveness. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Javier. So it seems that just through this first round of, uh, of responses, we, we have a high focus on education. Uh, it has been mentioned that in countries like Mexico, like uh, Qatar, the uh, high proportion of younger people tends to uh, gear this debate uh, to uh, the education for children uh, and younger adults. Um, I think uh, we will all agree that it's also important to look at the possibilities that lifelong learning will have and how a better integration of older age uh, part of the population, which are more common in uh, older industrial countries, is also critically important if we want uh, to see less inequality in, in the post-COVID environment. Um, let me now, uh, you know, the, the philosophy uh, uh, of, of Portulan and NRI is to bring together uh, people from uh, government, from business, from academia and from civil society to be mobilized together around the issues we, we care for. Um, so let me now turn to uh, Ankit as the, the representative of the, the business sector on, on this panel to, to ask you from the point of view of STL, that is a provider of technology um, uh, solution, what have you seen in terms of digital transformation as the major trends emerging? You know, where are the sensitive points we should be aware of for shaping this global recovery? Absolutely. Uh, so first of all, I think uh, we see that digital transformation trends are global. Uh, even industries which were otherwise being seen as laggards before. Work from home like trends are further accelerating this change. And more importantly, it's happening very close to end users. In telecom te technology, as we call it, right at the edge. More than 200, uh, more than 2.2 million new users in the 2020 alone got to experience digital applications for the first time. With education, healthcare, and, edu and other critical services relying on digital networks, this change will now drive to excel innovate innovations from everywhere. Most importantly, we saw telecom operators, governments, regulators, and even citizens playing their roles in accelerating this transformation. Telecom operators around the world are investing significantly to make this happen. We can take a few examples like British Telecom has committed $12 billion to build 5G networks and go full fiber broadband in more than 25 million homes in the UK. Verizon has committed more than $18 billion. In India, we see the government investing close to $4 billion and tier one operators like Airtel investing $5 billion in building out networks. Interestingly, cloud companies are building in massive data centers and across the board, we see about $120 billion being invested by them to build the connectivity of tomorrow. And then large enterprises are continuing to invest in both private LTE and now more and more private 5G networks for a variety of applications. And some of the most interesting early stage applications we have seen are in fact in the space of, in the ports, as well as more and more looking at how do we look at driverless cars as well as other technologies to bring this connectivity closer to home. So I believe this is something that will continue to accelerate uh, with time. In addition, we also see that the government operators as well as the private equity players are looking at very large investments to build this network. 
As examples, most recently we have seen that close to $65 billion is now committed by the US government as part of the infrastructure bill for network deployment. We have also seen the UK government, the Italian government, and as well as closer to home in India, over 20 to $25 billion being committed to subsidize the networks so that rural parts of the countries can get faster broadband, high quality broadband and lower latency broadband. And lastly, as I mentioned, we have seen huge investments now coming in from the private equity players. And I think that's a very, very important shift because it's a very important pool of capital that's now coming in to build these networks. And there are several such examples where, uh, where private equity players like KKR, uh, where we see EQT, so very, very large investments coming in because they see that as fiber networks get built out in particular, these are large scale networks which will almost serve like annuity kind of investments. And they see very positive returns as more and more usage comes to these fiber networks. Uh, in terms of STL itself, we've been very proud to be part of this broadband infrastructure build out globally. We are working with the tier one operators and the hyperscalers globally. I'm very proud to also say that we're working very closely with the Indian government and currently more than 50 million users in India are being deployed in the last two to three years in terms of fiber networks so that they can ride on our network. And this is particularly happening in, in rural India. We're also creating our own solutions in terms of um, what we call the GURF solution, which is creating digital solutions in rural India and we are finding some amazing use cases, especially in times of COVID, where people have used these digital centers for new and new age applications and so that their lives can get impacted. So overall, we see in summary, a tremendous network that is getting built out. We're seeing new pools of capital like private equity come in and we're seeing governments take tremendous new responsibility to build these networks so that the citizens can benefit from them. Thank you. Thank you, Ankit. So thank you for underlining all these very positive signs. That is, you know, 2.2 million additional users in 2020 alone uh, is already a very impressive uh, evolution. And when you add to that the fact that it's not just private funding that is being mobilized, it's also public funding, especially through the recovery packages, the Big Back, Build Back Better in, uh, in the US and, and others in the UK and the other countries you mentioned, these are very encouraging signs. They actually uh, coincide with analysis we've done at Cortulon around innovation. We've seen that COVID has not stopped, on the contrary, the financing for innovation, but somehow it has polarized that kind of investment, which has gone to a smaller number of sectors than before. So let me bounce back from what Ankit was just uh, describing uh, for you, Dr. Hessa, regarding the, what you see in Qatar, in the Middle East, regarding this financing, especially for the, the startups, these new ambitious uh, tech companies that we've seen sprouting around the world. Do, do you have good news for us? Yeah, 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 I have really good news. And you know, startups, they are very close to my heart. Uh, I think although the pandemic present major economic setback, it also led to an active startup ecosystem, according to data by Magnet, a MENA startup in 2020 saw a record of 1 billion in investment. And uh, this is up to 13% per percent more from 2019. And for the first quarter of 2021, uh, the, the startup raised more than $300 million in 37 deals. And uh, this is really great. And uh, and this is more than uh, 3,000 if I, if I will compare it to September 2022. So that's mean there is a huge investment when it comes to uh, startup. There are one things also that are very important. Now we are having an international VC in the region. US, US VC now, they are very active in, in region and they participate in eight deals, which, and which really shows that the international player now or uh, venture capital are looking to the uh, startup in, in a very uh, serious uh, way. Also, and I think I do believe that the, the, this is a sign of uh, maturing the ecosystem. We see more B2B startup emerge and raising funds 
more than B2C. Out of the 37 startups that raised fund in the first quarter of this year, 20 were in B2B space. And this all indication that the market is becoming more mature, the market is attracting international invest investor, and uh, and where uh, where all those startups they are in e-commerce, they are in fintech, and they are in logistic. And uh, one thing also I noticed that a lot of big player now are looking. If you look to Amazon, Amazon, they are going to open more than twelve uh, location in Saudi Arabia. Google are here here in Qatar. Uh, Microsoft uh, are, are here when I call, I mean, when it comes to their cloud, uh, Azure, it's all over uh, MENA region. And I think this is all kind of creating a positive vibe because people are now more keen to use uh, connectivity. And I thought uh, maybe I need to, to yeah, in MENA region, we always blame, blame uh, regulation. We always said we cannot do anything because of regulation. I do believe that this proves that we are wrong, because if you will go, if, if you will look, that the most critical reg regulated sector is the health, the health sector, and uh, through this, uh, COVID, 100% uh, 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 there are advancement in providing a health. Uh, or, or tele-health uh, uh, taking and their consideration, their privacy and security. Yeah, I think uh, what's happening now, if I will if I will forget COVID and the lockdown sometimes, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hessa. Thank you for uh, also uh, repeating how important the role of what we call enlightened regulators is. Uh, we need regulators who are fully able and enable to organize competition. That is to make sure that it's not a jungle out there, but at the same time, the really dynamic players can give their full potential. And I think uh, Qatar, when you were the regulator, has been one example in, in that area, especially regarding competition among mobile uh, operators. Um, your mention also of the fact that uh, the market uh, is maturing as witnessed by, uh, you know, a higher proportion of B2, B2B as opposed to B2C is, is something that we see in many, many parts of the, of the world. And it is indeed something we should keep track of and we will try to do that in, in NRI. Um, the, the points you mentioned about you know, the role of governments, regulators, etc., cetera, uh, offer me a good segue to turn back to, to Tofik uh, Tofik, you, you underlined in your first intervention the importance of not just looking at digital divides, but all, all kinds of divides, to have a broad, a broad vision about what needs to be, uh, to be addressed. Um, assuming that we can leverage higher connectivity, what are the ways in which you think this could contribute to alleviate some of these uh, big divides that you were signaling before? Uh, you're still on mute. Uh... Thank yes, you, Bruno, for this question. Uh, let me add to what my colleague said a couple of maybe dimensions. First of all, a linguistic dimension. We have done recently a major study, uh, and uh, we know that there are more than 7,000 languages out there. How many of these languages are used to provide digital content? Based on our study, at most 130 out of 7,000 existing languages. We looked at indigenous languages. We looked at minorities worldwide. So provided, let's say, a person has the digital infrastructure, has the access, has the financial means, but does not understand one of the languages in which content is provided. That is a major barrier that sometimes is overlooked. The second uh, dimension I would like to add is the digital skill set and the digital competency needed. We saw this also as another barrier. Uh, we, we have taken at UNESCO a major initiative. Uh, we, we are giving coding uh, and training classes in Africa. We saw 9 million, we did it for 9 million pupils. 
to prepare them to coding, to give them a minimum set of digital skills. Because again, if there is the access, the content, the language is not a barrier, how about the digital skill for a person to effectively use what digital, what the internet, what the platforms offer out there? So we, we came up with a whole curriculum on digital skills. We made it available to our 193 member states, and we recommended to them to adapt it and to integrate it into their educational system. To say, of course, we, we don't say one size fits all. But you know, here, uh, at least you don't start from scratch. We give you this uh, set of digital skills, this digital competency curriculum, and please adapt it and integrate it into in your schooling, in your educational programs, so you can prepare the next generation that is digitally savvy from a skill set point of view. This is what I would like to add. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kofik. And again, thank you for flagging two extremely important dimensions, the, the one of languages. Uh, as you know, and I'm talking from my previous experience as a member of the board of ICANN, a number of efforts have been made internationally to, to allow a uh, maximum number of uh, written languages to be used to define domain names. That's just one small technical step, but it allowed us when we were trying to do that to see how big uh, the exclusion was, and I'm using the, the word exclusion um, of certain uh, languages, which are often minority languages in, um, in their own countries. Or one tend to forget that, uh, and I'm sure that Antit will not uh, contradict me, uh, how many official languages in, uh, in India? Is it 11, 13? <laughs> so, so you have a high variety. In a country like South Africa, it's also about a dozen. So we should not forget that it's not just the main language in one country, it's all the languages which are spoken in different regions of the world that we have to take into account when we want to bridge these divides. And the fact that, Tofik, you mentioned the importance of skills, which, as you know, uh, in Portulan is very important for us because we also uh, lead the work on the Global Talent Competitiveness Index. And we looked in particular last year at these the, the divergences we see in artificial intelligence in the way talents can be uh, produced in emerging countries. Um, and I will use that, that question for, for Javier, uh, Mexico being one of those dynamic emerging economies, um, we, we can anticipate and when growth accelerates, the need for skills becomes more apparent. Is that something you see in the digital transformation context? Oh, definitely. Um, I, I think um, I think that we just saw something that is that 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 is over there, and and many do not pay attention. It just illustrated an inevitable situation. We have jobs that are going to disappear. There is always panic about it as as we are into this uh, fourth revolution, into this new e economy. Many jobs will disappear, and uh, many just face it with fear and uh, are not advancing towards it, creating new jobs or understanding what the new jobs will be. So I think that's a point that we need to put special attention instead of continuing with the same ones also. So um, yeah, just, just uh, one thing I will bring up uh, talking about index, Mexico in the ranking is uh, number 59. So the fact uh, that a large number of Mexicans are digitally engaged which in that point were 33 uh, in the in the index shows that the country has a platform on which uh, in which you, you can boost the well-being from from the, the digital world. Uh, nevertheless, it's it's a position with uh, which we cannot be satisfied. Not only is the connectivity, but it would be the content, it would be the access, it would be how to use the tool of internet to build the, the greater capabilities that we need uh, as a possible. Uh, social support, trying to understand all these uh, advantages that that gives you to be in connect. So, so by this means, I will have a, uh, I will give just two points. First, I think we need urgently to establish a legal framework with public policies and regulations that will guarantee the development of a digital innovation for social work. That uh, that includes. Uh, uh, Trends meaning confidence 
for uh, investors, entrepreneurs, venture capitals, so we could attract the eye and become appealing uh, to other countries, not only ours from the inside, but bringing from the outside. Uh, we need to somehow incentivize a, a better content for education, for training, for health, uh, for better household decision making, content for the new jobs, as I was saying, uh, trying to understand which ones are the ones that we're going to leave behind and how we're going to prepare the new generation. Or yet, there is so many free content in the, in the internet that you could study by yourself and be preparing yourself for, the, for these new, new challenges. And on the second po uh, point, um, to activate, and I want to say activate an entire entrepreneurial community, change the mindset. We need to change that as well. Uh, a community that not only innovates, but that it also transforms its knowledge into value of change. We need to make that to try to see the impact that we can have as a, as a community. Of course, this will expand the opportunities and the employees for, for Mexicans as, as it will be just uh, uh, an, a domino effect. So uh, two things that I, I could also approach, I would say that we cannot allow as humans a new crisis, being that as a health, another pandemic uh, or a climate one, uh, we have our goals on the 2030 agenda to surprise us uh, with a worsening of inequality, uh, of lack of opportunities, but only with the mechanisms uh, in place to reduce it. So I think that one thing that the Mexico's government right now is pushing forward, and I, I will leave this idea to the panel, is that we would always have to do it under the principles of solidarity, ethics, equality and inclusion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Javier. Uh, if I understood you correctly, uh, your idea is that if such a digital framework could be developed in Mexico, that would be more inclusive, more open, etc., it would play a significant role in helping Mexico to attract the talents needed uh, to feed a digitally driven recovery. Is that the proper uh, understanding I have? Yes, it is. And not only to attract, but to make our Mexican fellowships go into that, uh, in, in, into that highway. Adopt a mindset. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, going back to, to Ankit, because I think many of the things that Javier just mentioned uh, ring a bell with what you told us before, Ankit, about what your own company was doing to bridge rural urban divide but uh, especially in India. But taking the global point of view, because STL is, after all, a global company as well, um, what would you say are your best hopes that the newer technologies, AI, for instance, or others, may help build the, the device we're talking about? Did we lose Ankit? Well, it's probably trying to, to reconnect. So maybe I will use the, the same uh, uh, approach, uh, turning back to, um, to Dr. Hessa, um, because the, uh, Javier just mentioned the fact that you cannot, you should not be in a position to handle too many emergencies at the same time, a health emergency, uh, a climate emergency, and now possibly an inequalities emergency. So given your own interest in the sector of, of health, um, is that an area where you see things, things changing? And what would be for you the main elements we should consider in that area? Uh, you mean if I will associate it with, uh, uh, with the uh, crisis? That healthcare, is healthcare in particular. Yeah, yeah, oh, oh, yeah. I, I think I think when it comes to uh, to healthcare, uh, uh, maybe I think uh, if you uh, if I will share with you how Mina had dealt with the healthcare during the crisis, they did it like any. I, I mean, uh, they uh, did it, uh, and like uh, any other emerging eco economy, they uh, did it through two two things. Number one, all Mina countries have implemented physical response measure to the crisis. And all of them, they issued 
the uh, يعني number of policies and this policy 100% impact I mean small businesses and impact indirectly also the health the healthcare through uh, through easing the regulation a little bit and through providing uh, the health services remotely and uh, through even uh, even delivering medication uh, in the uh, houses instead of uh, of uh, people going there, there. so uh, so the, يعني, and uh, uh, also through investing or through giving the public sector more fund and uh, also through subsidizing the uh, clinic and private uh, doctor, especially during the uh, crisis, uh, the health sector had uh, had impacted a lot. Personally, I think I think it's now an opportunity for us to have a more resilient health. Uh, I really believe that. I know we rarely speak about uh, resilience in, in health sector because the uh, crisis only reflect because in some countries it was really even the very wealthy country. No one was prepared for this crisis. And I do believe that this might be an opportunity for all uh, countries without uh, in MENA or in any other country to make sure that their health is resilience for my assumption, this is only the beginning. Thank you. Uh, thank you for highlighting the notion of resilience as well. The, we have, uh, and I don't want to, to speak instead of the panelists, but I, I would like to, to hear from any of you about whether this notion of resilience has not been distorted from time to time as a disguised way to talk about protectionism to say we should not be dependent on external supplies, which one can understand, but it has often uh, driven uh, politicians and others to say, we need to develop our own vaccines. We need to develop our own protection. And um, the uh, possible consequence of that has been some kind of uh, egotism we've seen at international level. We see that with the lack of vaccines in Africa, uh, and the uh, Omicron uh, uh, variety uh, of the virus may uh, give further uh, uh, prominence to, to that. So I would be interested to hear from any of the panelists whether you think that technology can help there or whether there's something else that needs to be addressed to develop this notion of resilience at the global level instead of at the individual level. Or is that something that we cannot achieve? Bruno, I can maybe give a brief example here uh, to build resilience in education. When the pandemic hit back in um, February 2020, a couple of months after that, UNESCO set up a global education coalition with 200 members, ranging from public private sectors, academia, civil society, so, and the point is to say, we need to try to bridge or reduce this digital divide, but also to, to develop the, the digital content. And we need to, to, in a way, use technology and the digital uh, channel as a substitute to physical schooling. This uh, global education coalition of 200 members has so far benefited 400 million learners and 12 million teachers. <laughs> So this is not an egocentric. Uh, your question started saying, you know, trying to do it for yourself at the national level. This is a global attempt. Uh, parties that never cooperated before came together to say we have a noble cause to serve here. And it's technology companies. It is uh, financial uh, service players. It is government. It is multinational, supranational organizations. And when you can have an impact on 400 million learners, I think that's what we talk about. At the end of the day, what do we create for people on the ground? And the, the, bottom, the bottom line is a multi-stakeholder coalition uh, uh, trying to focus and to serve a shared cause. Thank you. Thank you, Tufik, for giving us this uh, uh, line of uh, hope 
because indeed there is a number of other signs that we need to to address, for instance, uh, uh, it's clear that in the technology area, we are moving toward another scarcity uh, zone, uh, the strain on logistical chain, the lack of uh, ICT component as putting a big uh, pressure on, on many, uh, many sectors. Um, the clearly uh, keeping borders open, keeping international trade as dynamic, may sound remote from technology, but it is one of these conditions by which resilience will not be distorted in an egotistic uh, meaning, but rather be seen as uh, something which should be a priority at the, at the global level. So th thank you for, for raising that, uh, that example. Um, I think we are not going to get um, uh, STL back on, uh, online. So, the uh, my next question was uh, was trying to see what was the point of view of the the, the business sector but um, since we cannot do that let me uh, actually move because we are getting close to the uh, the end of this um, this discussion to maybe a, a last question to uh, to javier um, about um, the fact that mexico is is a large country it is a federal country uh, which has advantages and disadvantages. Um, what are your, your views on the development of the physical infrastructure in terms of geographical barriers? What Akit mentioned earlier about rural versus, uh, versus urban. What are the, um, uh, the ways in which um, the cooperation between the private and public sector could help build, build bridge the, uh, sorry, the divides we've identified so far? Well, um, now that you put it that way, it's a very relevant question. As, as you know, uh, we have a lot of challenges talking in a physical infrastructure. Our country is um, under a lot of, of, of mountains, so it's accessibility is, is complicated. So close to the digital um, divide and increasing levels of, of well-being requires certainly uh, a co-responsibility of the public uh, of the public, uh, private, and, and social, uh, social sectors. We cannot see it as the responsibility of one, but we need to see it as the responsibility of all together. So um, if I can, if you, if you allow me, I, I'll, be, uh, I'll be brief. And just let me talk about my priorities from the framework of my public responsibilities, which by the way, what I'm trying to put through it is a, a co-responsibility way of working. So as the president of the Science, Technology, and Innovation um, Committee, uh, Commission of, of Congress, I am, I am working, uh, of course, as much as, as I can to, to build a, the greater consensus among legislators, uh, authorities, scientists, entrepreneurs, students, uh, private sector, to promote a, a greater equality and access uh, for all the Mexicans to, to, to the digital world. So I'm quite motivated, I'm very motivated because in, in alliance with my fellow legislators of, of, uh, of the commission, we are trying to implement a cross-cutting agenda so that innovation, technology, as well as science will have an impact on the work of uh, the parliamentary commissions. We need to, to uh, transmit that this concept is powerful, it's transversal. It is the engine of the economies, and it's something that should not be an optative uh, way of working, of studying, but that it has to be a priority in the formation of, of uh, new and future uh, generations. Second, um, a deep review of the regulatory uh, framework to encourage the technological development based on the principles of ethics, inclusion, as I said before, equality, non-discrimination, and gender equality, for, for, for example. And the third one would be a proactive conversation and cooperation with high-level organizations, such as the Portugal Institute. I am convinced that, that the innovative entrepreneurial talent of Mexicans will be benefited um, greatly by exchanging knowledge and the best practices. Uh, one of the things that I am always saying is share the knowledge. That's, that's an easy thing. We've achieved so many uh, uh, knowledge. We have wisdom. Now we have to share it so, so we could uh, somehow affect in a positive way all the other, all the other, uh, all the other countries. So I know that millions of, of Mexicans are looking for a more 
equalitarian country with great, with a greater well-being. And as a as a legislator, I'm determined uh, to offer a state of the art answer. Thank you, thank you very much again uh, for this positive tone as well on uh, what are the uh, possibilities that technology uh, uh, offers. Uh, we, we, this has been a very rich exchange so far. So uh, uh, in order to, to keep uh, with the, the time allotted for this uh, exercise, let, let me um, just ask you a very uh, simple uh, question, uh, and you will see um, that uh, the formulation will allow you to answer it quickly. Um, we have quite a large audience uh, for this uh, event. I'm looking at the, the figures here. Uh, coming from all parts of the, of the world and all uh, spheres of life. If you wanted that audience to leave this event with one word or one idea, okay, saying as far as the future of digital transformation is concerned, this is for me the element that is, that is key. What would that word or idea uh, be? Uh, maybe starting with you, Dr. Hassan. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I think I would say to number one a reference because I thought for the resilience health system, uh, we should have a resilience health system that is able to effectively adapt or respond to dynamic situation and reduce vulnerability across beyond the system. It's clear that we are having really dynamic system when it comes to uh, COVID. To to so the sentence that I want to leave. Disruption and technology is here. So let's present. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Javier, what would be your, your own word, keyword? Uh, more than a keyword, I like that one, will be a, a message which I pretended to be strong. I, and I would just leave it here. The digital innovation, it will only make sense when it makes the social environment more humane. human-centric, whatever the efforts we make. And uh, the last last word for you, uh, Tofik. Uh, the word from my side is MOVE, M-O-V-E. M for measuring digital divide effectively, O for creating open digital platforms, V for venturing forward together in an inclusive multi-stakeholder approach, and E for enhancing digital skills and capacities at all levels. We need to move. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for reminding how the UN is expert in providing words as acronyms. So you get one for the four for the price of one. Thank you very much. That was <laughs> very, very clever. And indeed, each of these four elements are critically important. And I think the um, uh, they uh, send us back to uh, many items mentioned during these very lively uh, discussions. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, Akit cannot be with us now, but I think I, I speak on his behalf saying this has been a very enjoyable conversation. I will not try to, to summarize it. You know, when the moderator says, I will not try to summarize it, that's just the opening sentence for his summary. Um, but I've been struck by a number of um, uh, very, very powerful statements from uh, our panelists uh, today. Um, I think that uh, these last keywords we heard uh, summarize them all. Um, the elements that was mentioned very early in the discussion by uh, Tofik Jelassi that we should not be hypnotized by one dimension of the divides, but look at whatever divides this uh, world um, in terms of knowledge, in terms of education, in terms of skills, uh, but also in terms of culture, in terms of what everybody can bring uh, to, to the table is critically uh, important. The um, element um, that was uh, mentioned by uh, uh, Dr. Hesse about um, focusing on health and resilience is critically important because it reminds us that you know, even if we try to speak about a post-COVID world, we are not out of the woods yet. That crisis is not over. So we have to deal with that one and technology can help. Uh, we also have an urgent necessity 
because as Sumitra mentioned before, um, the digital transformation is not anymore just a priority, it is a global imperative. We need to look beyond what we are trying to do in the, in the immediate emergency uh, areas. And this is where we hope that instruments that correspond to the M in uh, Tofik's move uh, last word, the measuring part can, can help. Um, th the discussion also allowed us to highlight various dimensions of these divides um, we are concerned about. Uh, we talk about age divides, we talk about rural urban, we talked about geographical divides, we also talked about gender uh, divides and language divides. So I'm tempted to uh, repeat something I've been uh, used to saying in this kind of meeting about why uh, French, and I would add Spanish because we have Javier here, are such superior languages to address the gender divide because there are languages in which the problem is masculine and the solution is feminine. Uh, maybe we can keep that as an example for our future work in that uh, area. Um, but uh, there were also very important signs uh, produced by these discussions about what are the skills that will be needed tomorrow to allow all countries, all economies, to take advantage of the huge opportunities that this accelerated digital transformation is yielding? And the answer is, we don't know. Uh, we don't know uh, whether uh, artificial intelligence will need more engineers, more uh, uh, programmers, or whether it will also need more psychologists, more lawyers, uh, more human-centric uh, uh, specialists. And I would like to use the, the words of, of Javier uh, in his latest intervention, saying that we can do a lot of things with technology, but if we want that, those efforts to be productive, they need to be human-centric. So I think that was a vibration that was very clear in all the interventions we heard uh, today. Uh, let's think about technology, but let's think about technology and implement technology in a way that always gives priority to the social dimension and the human being dimension. This is what NRI is about, and this is what we try to do at, at Portulon. So a big uh, thank you again to uh, all of our panelists. I hope uh, the uh, audience enjoyed the, uh, the discussion and that uh, it will be further encouragement to go into the report, to challenge its assumption, to help us make it even better in the uh, subsequent years. So a big thank you. And I now turn uh, maybe to Rafael, our CEO, to uh, close our meeting. Thank you so much, Bruno, for those words. I think um, you gave a good closing to, to the technical part. So I think I'm going to give a more general view and closing to the, uh, this um, really good session. So in 1968, the brilliant director, Stanley Kubrick, brought to the big screen the famous movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. This movie was based on the, on the novel by futurist Art, um, Arthur C. Clarke, and he wrote this novel the same year. This is 1968. So the movie depicts hotels in orbit, commercial flights to Jupiter with layovers in Mars, the moon, among other technological advancements that were predicted to be the norm in the year 2001. As we know, none of those happened. The movie and novel brought to the mainstream ideas of the science philosopher Thomas Kuhn, who in his book, The Structure of Science, Scientific Revolutions, written a few years before, coined the term paradigm shift, which in short means that when it comes to technology, there is no written trajectory. This is something that this great pandemic of the 21st century has reminded all of us about. Our plans as a global society can take unexpected turns and quickly shift sometimes upwards and well, sometimes downwards, altering not only the way technology develops, but also how society does. Today, we have the chance to hear the views and experiences of various experts from different corners of the globe with different perspectives on how digital technology changed multiple times its direction to help us cope with unforeseen event. Yet, among all of these voices, we could still identify a common denominator. While chance, while change is inevitable, working collectively and using technology as a tool for, for readiness is somewhat uh, a way to, to, de to develop a stable path towards better future 
and this future can still be outlined. Well, with these final words, I wanna thank everyone and conclude uh, this, this session. I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Hessa, Dr. Director Ankit, Congress President Javier, Dr. Tofik, Mr. Mohammed for his great insights. And I also want to extend my gratitude to our advisory and technical board members and to the Porto Lens Institute team, in particular, Bruno Sumitra and especially Avdala, Sylvia Antal and Marion Chadunelli. This was possible due to your hard work. Thank you everyone for joining us today and I hope you had enjoyed this. We will answer your questions later. <laughs>